May it please the court and members of the jury, excuse me just a moment. Hello, Scott. So this is not a jury argument, okay? And the two hours the statute gives for me to summarize my case, that doesn't matter, right? Well, I guess that is relief. Thanks. Boy, I'm glad he <laughs> called when he did. <laughs> so what a wonderful thing to be at Trinity this morning and how I wish you were here with me. Thanks to Scott for getting me out of the courtroom and into the pulpit and offering a little bit of helpful advice about how to know the difference between the two. As you may have heard, my presence in the pulpit today is a step along the path toward occasionally preaching here at Trinity when asked or offering a helping hand to small diocesan churches when the rector has too much going on to prepare a sermon. Supporting small churches is part of the mission of Iona WNC, a school for ministry, a collaboration that we have with the Episcopal Seminary of the Southwest. I am privileged to serve as its New Testament faculty member, and I will say that I would not be in that position if it had not been for my wonderful years here with you at Trinity, uh, teaching and reading and interpreting the Bible together in community. Iona offers a rigorous three-year seminary program to people who need to remain locally present in their own communities. It is an alternative for those who are seeking holy orders uh, but are unable to enroll in a traditional, reg a traditional residential seminary such as Swanee or VTS or General. Among the great riches I have found in studying and teaching the New Testament over many years has been an intense and comprehensive focus on the Synoptic Gospels. What, you might ask, does the phrase Synoptic Gospels mean? Well, Gospel means good news of God's saving action, and Synoptic means to see together. So when we speak of the Synoptic Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, we are talking about good news of God's saving action that we can see at work when we read these three books in relationship to each other. Exploration of these and other biblical texts is best done by looking through different lenses. We might use a historical lens. We might use a literary lens. We might use a theological lens. We might use a lens of community, whether ancient or modern. These lenses allow us to ask good questions about the Bible, including the Synoptic Gospels. Some are academic. For instance, which came first? Or how is it that they are so similar, yet in so many ways quite different? You may have noticed that I said Mark, Matthew, and Luke a few moments ago, departing from the New Testament order. The reason is that most biblical scholars date Mark as the earliest gospel and posit that Matthew and Luke relied on Mark and his story of Jesus when crafting their own gospels. But you will also notice that Matthew and Luke are much longer than Mark. So what's going on here? When we look at them closely, we find that Matthew and Luke share a lot of material that Mark does not have. The most common materials including sayings of Jesus, for instance, what we find in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount or Luke's Sermon on the Plain. While these shared sayings do not come to us today in a single document, biblical scholars have reconstructed a hypothetical book containing the sayings, which they call Q, the first letter in the German word spelled Q-U-E-L-L-E, -E, and pronounced, as well as I can tell, not speaking German, Quela, which means source. Matthew and Luke also each have their own unique materials not shared with anyone else. We might think of Matthew's parable in the sheep of the goats, excuse me, his parable of the sheep and the goats. We might think of Luke's parable of the good Samaritan. The hypothetical sources transmitting these unique materials are called M for Matthew's independent source and L for Luke's independent source, respectively. The sources may have been oral or written. We simply don't know. They, like Q, are lost to us. But before I proceed a little further, let me assure you of this. This is the best that scholarship can tell us. It's not essential to our faith. It is not a matter of doctrine or theology. It is ways to try to interpret scripture. 
So with that background in mind, let's now reorient from the Synoptic Gospels generally toward today's specific reading. The Gospel before us is taken from Mark. It tells of Jesus' first acts of public ministry. If we look just a bit earlier in the Gospel, we see how fast we are moving in Mark. It is a breathless pace almost. Mark has packed a lot in 20 verses. So let's start there. Matthew, excuse me, Mark's story of Jesus says at the first verse, the beginning of good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The good news, a strong, concise, powerful opening. Over the next 19 verses, Jesus is baptized by John, tested in the desert, and calls his earliest disciples. These episodes offer words about Jesus. The first words of Jesus are found in verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So there we have it again, the good news, gospel. Given these tw twin declarations about gospel, we would do well, it seems, to look through one of our lenses and pay attention to what happens when we interpret it that way. So let's use the literary lens. We will look through that to see what the kingdom of God or the good news looks like through Jesus' first appearance in his public ministry. Having recently called two pairs of fishermen as his first four disciples, we should not be surprised that they find themselves in the town of Capernaum along the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. It is in this place where we join them on the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. Jesus is teaching at the synagogue on the Sabbath. Twice the congregation sees his authority. What does that authority look like? His teaching might be that of a wise sage or a powerful preacher. But what is most remarkable in this passage is his healing presence. And when I say healing presence, that's a bit of an understatement. Because the power to, make, to heal or to make whole is poignantly expressed next. Jesus casts out an unclean spirit who, despairing of its own destruction, declares that Jesus is the Holy One of God. With this lightning strike, the people are amazed at Jesus' words and his deeds and authority, and his fame spreads throughout Galilee. We can feel the electricity in the passage, but we would do well to be careful with how we handle this flash, lest we get burned. Epiphany is a season of light, of revelation, and though it can come in a flash, we may also want to slow down a bit before getting carried away by the moment and let that light settle on us and warm us and let us bask in it. After all, who in this passage has named the source of, of Jesus' power? It is a demon, a being who creates misery and chaos. A demon is not a terribly reliable or credible witness. Would you want to make your case through one? When the, demon, when the demon declares who Jesus is, it gives a label, but only a label. It does not touch the heart of Jesus or the full nature of his mission. It only exclaims what Jesus means to the demon and his own cohort, a powerful threat to the unclean spirits of the world. An exclamation that is only about power leaves much to the unknown. It does, not touch his, it does not touch Jesus' compassion for the sufferer. We must therefore discern what it fully means to be the Holy One of God over time as Mark takes us along the way. Because the time has not yet arrived for that to be revealed fully, Jesus rebukes the demon and demands its silence. And thus begins the Galilean springtime, the section of Mark's gospel filled with powerful imagery but with much meaning yet to discern. The beautiful, crowded, breathless phase of that ministry dominates the first eight chapters of Mark. It is depicted in preaching, teaching, and healing, all signs of the kingdom of God. Jesus becomes a popular figure who commands a larger following. But ominous signs arise as well, and they are at least implied in this passage, because you see, when a new authority comes, what does that do? That disrupts the old authority. 
And old authorities don't go away with quietness and acceptance. Sometimes they meet what this new authority is that Jesus is bringing with a reactionary response because it's a paradigm shift. Authority from God empowers the moment and the congregation imaginatively compounds those possibilities. But does that compounding guarantee that the hopes and dreams and expectations of this group of people will be met? Possibilities can be endless in the eyes of the beholder. Some may seek simply wisdom or healing, relief from the demons that plague them. Others may respond differently, seeking a larger vision. Others still may place their confidence in their own understanding of what the arrival of the Holy One means. Two of the first four disciples will ask to sit next to Jesus when he comes to, into his kingdom. But do they understand what that kingdom will look like? An abiding theme of Mark is that people who follow Jesus see his glory, but not the cost, and are blinded by their own expectations. Those who spread the word do not yet see what that authority means or where it might eventually lead. And they certainly do not see how it could lead to the peculiar form of Roman execution reserved for those who endanger the Pax Romana. A theme of the 600-page book on the crucifixion written by the Reverend Fleming Rutledge, who served as Scott's professor of preaching at General Seminary, is that we must always read the New Testament in light of the crucifixion. That terrible, humiliating, painful, degrading, killing event. Power alone, therefore, does not tell the whole story of Jesus. Self-sacrificial love, too, matters. So does the truth. Researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology found that falsehoods on Twitter are shared at a much faster rate than accurate confirmed stories. In a 2018 article about their study published in MIT News, we find the following statement. False news is more novel and people are more likely to share novel information. And on social networks, people can gain attention by being the first to share previously unknown but possibly false information. Thus, people who share novel information are seen as being in the know. Are we subject to that temptation, wanting to be in the know? To have the distinction of being the ones ahead of the knowledge curve, dispensing the latest and greatest news to others? If so, we might consider the quick to react, quick to proclaim congregants at the Capernaum synagogue and the chastened demon who haunted one of their own. We might compare what they do to what this Jesus now does, the one who rebukes the unclean spirit for speaking and demands its silence. What does that dynamic teach us? The congregation knew something powerful and different was afoot. The people were gathered in the presence of the holy and they were desperate to share it. How do we at Trinity discern now, during the season of lights, the epiphany of God's revelation. What does this story, a forecast of so much to come in Mark's gospel, have to teach us for our times? We have been living out an excruciating phase of our national life. Like these early witnesses to Jesus' public ministry, we sometimes assert our first impressions boldly, as if their implications are clear, as if we have seen the next great thing and understand what it all means. And then we are left in our pride to defend those premature positions and declarations. Of this offense, I am a repeat offender. Enthusiasm is a wonderful thing. I feel it myself. Often I act on it too quickly. And so, too, is discernment a wonderful thing. Discernment teaches us that when we hear and speak of good news, an exuberant declaration alone is not enough. We must be open to learning what the good news means. When we hear and speak it, 
we must let that be a way to give voice to the message that God is calling us to give. We must be open to learning where it calls us and how devastating things can be along the way to the fulfillment of that promise of good news. What we may think we see is not always self-evident truth. Sometimes it be, must be understood, interpreted, and applied over time. But in the end, we remember that it is indeed good news because God calls us into the kingdom through it. And now it is time to leave the Capernaum synagogue in Mark's gospel. In that gospel, Jesus is in motion, always in motion. We experience the urgency of the moment with him and move along ever forward. How is he calling you to accompany him? How do we know that we understand that call? And how open must you and I and all of us be to the unexpected turns along the way, off of what we thought was once our clear path and in another direction? A new stretch we are called to travel with enthusiasm tempered by discernment, allowing electric news of the power of God to be filtered through wisdom and to form love. Such are the paths that we follow when we journey into the kingdom of God.